And hello to the folks that are just joining us. We still have about 10 minutes before our event gets started. Um, again, I apologize to those of you who are already on the call. You're gonna hear me make this announcement several more times before um, we get to 2.30. As you're joining in, you'll notice that your microphones are muted. Um, that's because of the number of people on the call that happens automatically. If you're one of our speakers, um, you can unmute your microphone. You will have to unmute it. We can't unmute it for you. So um, if you are going to be talking during the discussion today, please remember to unmute your microphone first. If you are not a speaker for the program, um, we are going to keep your um, microphone muted just uh, to cut out some of the ambient noise. Um, that might be going on uh, in your household. We do have a chat room function. Uh, thanks, Charity, for kicking it off there. And feel free to drop your questions in. In fact, we encourage you to ask questions during the show using the chat function. That is how um, our moderator will pull questions from the audience. So instead of asking your questions via your microphone, um, please do so uh, with the chat room. And then we will uh, have our panelists ask, answer questions that way. And again, for those of you who are just joining, uh, your microphones are muted automatically. If you're a speaker, you can unmute your microphone. If you're not, we would ask that you keep your microphone on mute and uh, then use the chat room function in the top right corner uh, to ask your questions. All right, thanks everyone uh, for joining the meeting today. We still have a few minutes before we get started. Um, as you join, you'll notice that your microphones are muted. Uh, that is partly because we have so many people joining the call, um, but also by design, we'll keep your mics muted um, unless you are one of the speakers for the event. We do encourage folks to ask questions. You can do that um, by using the chat function, which is in the top right corner of your window. You'll see two little icons there, one a little person icon, and then one a little chat window. Um, just click on that and you can ask your questions. Our moderator will pull questions from the chat window for our panelists there. We have about six minutes before we get started. Um, and so that means y'all are gonna hear me make this announcement at least twice more. So I apologize for that. Um, and thanks for your patience while uh, everybody else joins the call. Um, and just to note, we will also uh, be recording um, this call or this call, this meeting, this event um, for future use. So um, the, just so you are all aware of that. If you would prefer to turn off your camera, um, you're more than welcome to do that as well.
In fact, if the more people that uh, the more people that join, um, the more we don't see most folks' uh, camera anyway. So. Hi, Therese, can you hear me? Therese, are you there? Sorry, I was muted. Yes, I can hear you, John. Uh, one of our speakers is having difficulty connecting. Can you maybe send um, that person the, the link that we're I, using? I yep. Okay, thanks. And for everyone dialing in right now, uh, thanks for joining us today. We will get started here in about two minutes, um, but right now you'll notice that as you call in or as you connect that your microphone is muted. Um, we are muting everyone's microphones automatically. Our speakers will be the only one uh, who uh, will unmute their microphone when uh, it's their time to talk, and that's just so uh, we don't have any ambient noise. Um, during the event. If you would like to ask questions, and please do ask questions. We definitely want um, audience participation. Use the chat function in the top right corner of your window. You'll see two little icons there. One uh, looks like a little um, person, and that's where you can see the list of people on the call. And then right next to that, you see the chat function. Click that. It opens up a box, a window in the bottom of that. You can type your questions, and that's where uh, our moderator will pull all of the questions from for the event. Uh, we are going to keep everyone else muted uh, during the call, and we can do that automatically. For our speakers, I'll note that you will have to unmute your own microphone. So when you get ready to talk, just make sure that you are uh, unmuted.
All right, and we still have folks joining the call, um, but again, just before I turn it over to our speakers today, uh, thanks for joining us. And uh, as again, as I've noted, all of your microphones are muted. Uh, they will stay muted throughout the program. We're doing that automatically. If you have questions, please feel free to ask your questions using the chat function, which is in the top right corner of uh, your window here. And since it is 2.30, um, I'm going to turn it over to, um, to our host for the event today. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. And thanks to Astrid Scale for joining or for hosting us. Um, I'm Teresa Jones. I'm the Senior Director of Policy at the Satellite Industry Association. Um, we're joined here today by Dan Oldtroga, Center for Space Standards and Innovation at AGI. Marlon Sorga um, at the Center for Orbital and Reentry Debris Studies at the Aerospace Corporation, um, Charity Whedon at Astroscale, and John Jenka of Viasat. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to give some quick background on the domestic policy situation um, and SIA's perspective on this orbital debris rulemaking. And then I'm going to hand it over to our panelists for about five to seven minutes of comment each. Um, and then we'll do some questions and also take questions from the audience. So as Sarah mentioned, you can use the chat function to ask questions. Um, we have people uh, who will be logging your questions throughout the discussion. So feel free to post them on the chat at any time. We'll hopefully get to them a little bit later um, in this conversation. So again, thanks everyone for joining. Um, as many of you may know, uh, this discussion started way back in 2004 when the SEC um, released its original oral debris mitigation um, guidelines. And we haven't really seen much in terms of domestic policy update until very recently. But in May 2018, uh, the National Space Council put out Space Policy Directive 2, um, which suggested there should be a one-stop shop in the Department of Commerce for um, all sorts of space licensing that's not covered by other agencies. Um, space Policy Directive 3 shortly followed in June 2018, and it specifically directed the administrator of NASA in coordination with the Secretaries of State, Defense, Commerce, and Transportation, Director of National Intelligence, um, and in con consultation with the Chairman of the FCC, to update the US oral debris mitigation standard practices and establish new guidelines for satellite design and operation as appropriate and consistent with applicable law. So that sort of really kicked us off in reviewing you know, what the US was doing on oral debris policy. Um, and it asked the Secretaries of Commerce and Transportation in consultation with the FCT chairman to assess the sustainability of incorporating these updated standards and best practices into their respective licensing processes as appropriate and consistent with applicable law. Um, then on the legislative side, so that was the executive branch side, um, there needed to be some sort of legislative um, activity to be able to approve the Department of Commerce as this one-stop shop, um, which has not yet happened. There were competing bills on the Senate and House sides. Um, the Space Frontier Act was on the Senate side, um, they were looking to authorize the FAA to license um, procedures that were that didn't fall neatly into any of the other agencies. Um, the House had looked at the American Space Commerce Free Enterprise Act, and that was more trying to authorize commerce to do um, to certify these efforts. Um, and they never ended up reconciling. Um, migrating to November 2018, the FCC put out this notice of proposed rulemaking on orbital debris um, mitigation. So that was what prompted all of this. Um, at the same time, NASA, per Space Policy Directive 3, was looking to update its standards and the orbital debris mitigation um, practices. So in April of 2019, it updated NASA standards 8719.14, um, which go into detail about some orbital debris mitigation guidelines. And it also updated the US oral debris mitigation standard practices um, in November of last year. So everyone was thinking, you know, the SCC is going to use this guidance from NASA and uh, in this rulemaking um, as instructed by Space Policy Directive 3. And we did see that in a lot of the draft order that um, was released. So moving forward to today, 
Um, the SEC did incorporate a lot of these guidelines um, into the draft order. We have yet to see the adopted order today, but we heard a bit about it from the SEC commissioners um, a couple of hours ago. Um, they did use a lot of standards from NASA. Um, there were some, however, that where they deviated from the NASA standards um, that caused concern for a lot of industry and some of government. And a bunch of those ended up getting moved to a notice, a further notice of proposed rulemaking. And the items that got moved, which we'll talk about in detail during this conversation, were there was concern about whether you use an individual satellite or, an, or the aggregate constellation for the probability of collision. Um, so the draft had initially asked that the aggregate probability of collision for a satellite constellation um, could be at most one in a thousand. And if you're talking about, you know, a large constellation of thousands of satellites, um, there was a lot of argument that the NASA standards had only applied to individual satellites. So maybe that's something we should look at as a whole um, and see if, you know, you can apply that standard to aggregate constellations or if there's any other better measurement. Um, casualty risk was another one. Uh, in the draft, it suggested that the casualty risk should be effectively zero. Um, rather than the NASA standard. There was a lot of concern, particularly amongst the CubeSat community, about maneuverability. Um, it wasn't clear from the draft order that uh, differential drag was going to be a viable means of propulsion. Um, and there's no current um, mechanism of propulsion for 3U or smaller CubeSats that would fit that, cat that category. So they were going to ask everyone who was above 400 kilometers to use um, some sort of propulsion, which could potentially kill the CubeSat um, community. Um, they're also moving the accidental explosion risk, um, moving indemnification, which I know is of concern for a lot of companies, um, how the SEC could enforce it. Uh, the overall rulemaking um, was unclear about how indemnification would be enforced unless it was by, they already had a bond component um, in the FNPRM, which would ask satellite operators to put down a bond um, when they launch satellites and they would get it back if they successfully uh, deorbited their satellites or moved them to a grade guard orbit. Um, and then the final thing that got moved um, was the 25 year rule. Um, so, you know, the guideline, the IADC guideline to uh, deorbit your satellite 25 years um, after use. And we'll see how those are worded exactly in the FNPRM, hopefully by next week. And uh, a lot of people have asked what actually remains uh, in the order. Um, assuming that they um, only move the items that they talked about today, some important um, measures that they took that should be in the final order um, include requiring that NGSO systems coordinate with all other NGSO systems um, if there's a potential um, for their constellation to um, impact the operation of others. Um, it also includes you have to disclose your ability to track your own satellites and how they'll be tracked um, by active or passive means. You're also required to uh, use unique telemetry markers for each satellite that you launched. I know that's been a problem if you're um, launching large groups of satellites at once, you don't know which one is which um, in tracking. You're also supposed to disclose registration and sharing information um, regarding deployment, ephemeris data, planned maneuvers with the 18th Space Control Squadron. Um, and you also have to require that upon getting a conjunction warning, you'll review and take all possible steps to assess collision risk and mitigate this collision risk if necessary. So I think that's where we are today um, with the uh, order and what will be moved to the FNPRM. Again, we'll see um, what the details are hopefully next week when they release the full order that they adopted. So from an SIA perspective, um, SIA is a trade association representing around 50 uh, satellite operators, manufacturers, ground equipment suppliers, and launch companies. Um, and we've been working on space sustainability for a long time. Um, in a little bit, I'll put our space debris mitigation guide, our own space debris mitigation best practices in the chat. Um, we've been working as an organization to come up with high level guidelines 
bunch of things that we had talked about were things that were covered in the report and order, such as doing everything that you can to mitigate um, possible conjunctions and thinking about sustainability and choosing a launch provider. Um, we had initially commented um, on the draft or on the NPRM, um, you know, just hoping that all different government agencies would work together to ensure consistency of rules. And when the draft order came out, um, all we had, we came up with um, comments on the draft order. Um, two of our members objected to those comments and one abstained. Um, but the majority of our members uh, felt that it was important um, to have further discussion about where the orbital debris mitigation standard practice, well, where the FCC was not consistent with the NASA orbital debris mitigation standard practices. And most of the items that we flagged were the ones that moved to the FNPRM. So just really wanted to hear further discussion about why the FCC was deviating from government standards, wanted to make sure they were consistent, and I'm glad that we're going to have further discussion on this. Um, so on that note, that's just the current policy stage. And I've asked Dan to give us an overview um, of the national policy. I didn't recognize you. I'm sorry, Teresa. You broke up again there, but I, I'm going to dive in right here, I guess. I can turn my screen quickly. Let's see. Which screen am I sharing? There we go. Yeah, so I just wanted to follow up on Teresa's comments. That's a, she gave a very good uh, introduction on uh, an overview of, of what's in the FCC guidelines and uh, you know um, how that relates to the uh, operator perspective and, and some of the other documents and, and uh, guidelines that are out there. So I thought I might start with uh, presenting very briefly a, a study that we've been doing within the AIAA to characterize where all these treaties and guidelines, best practices, principles, uh, national regulations, which is the topic of this telecon, and then finally the non-binding aspirational sort of best practices that, that industry has assembled. And they're all, um, I, I want to just say up front, these, all these types of documents, be they binding and non-binding, we found to be very important. Just because something's not binding doesn't mean that it's not critical to, to uh, safety of flight. And of course, binding ones are, are important as well. Now, this is an eye chart, I realize. I, I hope you can see this all. But this is a uh, result from last year's study. This is before the RNO came out, Rules and, uh, and Regulations and Order. Um, and uh, actually, it was Therese that evaluated the FCC component of the U.S. Uh, commercial regulations, which uh, is shown by this green arrow here, if you can see that. So the FCC regulation is a part of the commercial regulations that commercial operators uh, have to adhere to. And uh, in this chart, if, if there's, a, well, I'll start out on the left. There are various rolled up aggregate uh, traits here, capacity building, casualty risk, contamination, and so forth. And there are many, many aspects to each of these. So this chart represents an aggregate, a composite of all these different regulations and requirements. And, uh, and then on the, top axis here, each, um, each cell or each column rather, is a certain uh, instrument, legal instrument, or in this case, in the national regulations, it represents the company in aggregate. But note the special thing here on the, on the US section, the US is very different because it has uh, separate regulations for commercial and for civil, uh, slash NASA and for military. So we're a, a complex uh, regulatory environment, but we're focused on the green arrow here. I did go through and update Teresa's uh, initial cut on the FCC document. And again, 
noting that this column represents the aggregation of not just FCC, but Department of Transportation and, and other uh, regulations. I'm going to switch to the next chart, and I'll, I'll go back and forth, and you can kind of see that uh, some things have indeed moved the needle. Um, there's, there's some safety elements here, uh, also contamination physical with, with all of the human casualty risk and so forth, and then also in the safety area. So, um, you know, those, those things I would say uh, do make a material in, uh, difference and contribution, but as we heard this morning, some of these, uh, some of these things are uh, no longer in the current RNO and, and will be, uh, you know, uh, discussed and, and proposed in the future. Uh, just, to, just to note, I will be making these charts available to, to uh, AstroScale after the meeting, and, and we'll, we'll get these shared out for you if you'd like. Um, now, I wanted to dive into a little bit of, of the FCC regulations and just talk to some of those requirements. Some of the requirements are actually fairly stringent, but they're not detailed. So for example, in our, um, in our assessment in the AIAA Space Traffic Management Task Force to look at space governance, when we did those previous charts, we looked at the product of how detailed is a requirement and how demanding is it? It's the it's the product that we that we used. Now that may not be the best metric in, in you know in, in somebody's interest or, or in, in some cases, but that's the one we went with. And I note that some of the some of the requirements in the FCC document are fairly demanding, but at the same time, they're not that detailed. So so what it, that gets at is what algorithm is used to compute that? What's the uncertainty about the input data feeding that algorithm? Those are all issues to, to point out. And I wanted to share in my uh, pro program management of the Space Data Center on behalf of the Space Data Association, I wanted to share a perspective that not everybody uses the same metrics. We see some collision probability metrics in the FCC document, uh, but there are various flavors of, mac of probability. There's maximum probability, which does not actually need a uh, object size and, and covariance. Then there's kind of your typical uh, prob uh, collision probability, which does require uh, object size. Typically, it's treated as a sphere and, um, and covariance. But then you can dive into more detailed versions because how many satellites out there are flying that that are actually shaped like a sphere so um, you know you can really go into multiple levels of collision probability but the other thing i wanted to share with you is depending on your orbit regime and the density of objects in that orbit regime i.e how frequently do you come close to something else and are at risk of collision you could choose a different metric to, to best suit your operations needs, your staffing needs, the complexity that you can deal with, um, and, and uh, the maneuver fuel you have. If you have all kinds of maneuver fuel, you could, you could afford to be quite conservative. So there are a fair number of operators out there, in fact, especially in, in GEO, where collision probability is not even computed. They focus on um, radial separation at the time of closest approach, knowing that in-track uncertainty can be uh, a large, if not the largest component of an uncertainty. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there to say, it's not one size fits all. Um, there, are, there are a variety of metrics. Um, this, this chart speaks to the, the different levels of fidelity. You can see that rather than treating a satellite as a sphere, you can treat it as a, a full object where you've got the, uh, the cutout basically in the normal to the relative velocity of, of the objects in question. And then this chart shows you all the different um, possible metrics. And I shouldn't say all of them, but this just gives you a sample that there are many, many 
different types of metrics. And many of these are not actually represented in the FCC's uh, regulations today. Um, I think I already addressed the first bullet, um, but the second one's very important because we keep talking about collision probability, but again, how many satellites are spheres? And then this requires object size, it requires covariance, well, how realistic is the covariance that's there? And where does that object size come from? We have a lot of uh, research we've done, which shows the multiple orders of magnitude that, that these solutions can be off uh, by just having the, or assuming the wrong inputs for, for covariance and, and object size. So there you go, multiple orders of magnitude. So this, I would note, is a gap in, in not just the FCC document, but anything that, that has a, a threshold on collision probability. We haven't standardized on what algorithm to use for collision probability, and uh, casualty risk is maybe a little further along. There is some standardization of that, uh, but, but still not totally uh, adopted and uh, uni universally, I'd say. Um, and so that's something to think about, but again, as I presented, there are a whole bunch of metrics that, one, that an operator may choose to use. Now, this last section I wanted to just share with you is talking about how we get long-term sustainability. And I'm just gonna float this out there that um, long-term sustainability as, as a debris mitigation and, and debris analyst is certainly a goal that I think we should be striving for. It means responsible operations, and it has a lot of different aspects to it. This kind of breaks it down into the three main ones, prevention, remediation, and mitigation. And those are defined here. Prevention is avoiding predictable collisions. Remediation is removing massive debris objects. And then mitigation is not creating any new debris or releasing new debris. So, um, by the way, the, the, the size of these is my personal take on the importance of these various components. And mitigation, I think, is, is a very uh, critical one. They're all critical, uh, but, but there's some components here that, that we need to really move out on. And so if I further break down prevention, remediation, and mitigation, you can see the various components with debris removal, collision avoidance, some things are in the satellite design and mission design phase, but post-mission disposal is a critical element. This is something that the FCC has a 0.9 number in their, their uh, R&O, um, but it is a critical one, not just that we have a number, but that we actually adhere to it. And th there have been some questions I've seen floating around talking about how things get monitored. And that, I think, is a, a good topic for our continued discussion. Some people wonder where space traffic management and space uh, situational awareness fit, and then also the, the space data and safety standards that are out there from entities like ISO and CCSDS. I view those as foundational for all these different areas. Um, and then, to jump to the long-term sustainability guidelines that were recently adopted at the UN level last, uh, last June. Um, I took the, those clauses and with the new numbering that those have once they were adopted, I just dropped them into the various areas that they pertain to. And what you can see is that there's very good coverage of, of this whole landscape with the notable exception that space traffic management is, is not really addressed in the LTS guidelines. That's not all that surprising because SSA and some of the other elements are talked to, and space traffic management has many different definitions, uh, which can lead to confusion. Now on the US side, um, I'm also of course keenly interested in Space Policy Directive 3 to see where that lies, and I went through those clauses as well and those actually do a fairly good job of, of covering this whole landscape as well. Um, so I do want to note the FCC R&O, these rules, uh, yeah, there's a lot of disagreement and, and discussion about how to move forward. But in my analysis of these 
uh, for the AIAA STM uh, task force, I note that it does move the needle in a material way if those clauses uh, became the rules. Um, and, and so, you know, you do have this natural tension between um, what is convenient for an operator to do, what's possible for the operator can do. We can't really have rules that are unobtainium, so to speak. And then also from a LTS standpoint, what we should be doing. It's, it's that whole uh, in aggregate that we uh, need to figure out moving forward. So um, anyway, that concludes my prepared remarks. I'd be happy to uh, answer questions, I suppose, at the end of this or, or whenever Therese uh, says. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Dan. Um, next, we'll move on to Marlon. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Ah, okay. Major breakthrough then. Uh, I, I apologize for all that that technical issues that I had getting on there. In spite of all the rehearsals, nonetheless, there were still problems. So um, I, I missed your introduction. Um, so I hopefully am not going to repeat anything. But um, certainly Dan's was a, a fantastic lead into some of the, the little bit of what I was going to talk about. So we all set? Yes, we're set. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so I, uh, I, I don't know whether you uh, gave any introductions at the beginning. Um, I introduced everyone and just gave a brief overview of domestic policy. Okay, okay, thanks. So um, I'm uh, I, I'm Marlon Sorge. I've uh, I work with uh, the Aerospace Corporation. I've been dealing with um, uh, debris work for thirty some years now. Um, and uh, just for reference, uh, Aer Aerospace is a, a federally funded research and development center. So we're a, a nonprofit uh, that supports uh, the space enterprise. Uh, obviously, the area of the debris is a problem for everybody that's operating in space, uh, which is one of the reasons that we, uh, you know, have a particular interest in trying to uh, trying to deal with the problem. And uh, I think as um, that um, the the issue is, as Dan was talking about, especially at the end. Uh, whenever you're trying to put together a, a set of, of rules or guidelines or anything else, and um, uh, this is something obviously that the FCC had to deal with when they were working on these, is, is that you're, you're really trying to do this, this balancing act. Um, you know, if you were, the only thing you said in this case was, I want, to, um, I, I want to just protect the environment, the answer is easy, don't launch anything. But uh, clearly that's not practical. You, you're, you're doing that balancing between, between the things that you're trying to protect and the things that you're trying to accomplish. And, and there's a lot of different factors that go into that uh, to uh, you know, try to find the, the right combination that, that both protects your future and lets you do what you need to do now. Um, you know, there's, one of the issues is that uh, in a, a lot of these areas, um, there's there's different there's actually different things that you're trying to accomplish um, at, at, at potentially at the same time. Uh, so, for example, with with debris, one of the things that we're clearly trying to do is prevent the debris environment from getting worse. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, a lot of efforts that go on, a lot of the rules that are that are designed to do that to in the long term control the growth of the debris environment so it doesn't get out of control. Uh, a, a good example of that is uh, the 25-year the rule, uh, the idea that you put your satellites somewhere so that they're not going to be hanging around a, a long time to end up colliding with something and making debris. The, the, um, that collision probability, the 0 0.001 with, with large objects, that's, that's been the discussion of a lot, of, of, um, uh, a lot here uh, that, that Dan was talking about. That is essentially going after the same type of issue that the 25-year rule is. Don't hang around somewhere in some way that's going to cause you to get hit by something and create a bunch of debris. Uh, so you, you've got those concerns, but, but then you've also got some of the shorter-term concerns, like 
like uh, collision avoidance. Again, something that, that Dan was talking about. You want to be able to protect your your satellite from uh, the what you might see as as an, an imminent problem of something coming close to you. Uh, and it, it isn't always the case that um, the what what's good for the long term environment and what's good for you having a low collision avoidance rate for your satellites are going to be the same thing. And you've got stuff thrown in there. Uh, the uh, problems with collision avoidance, you know, oh, I get a warning. Um, maybe somebody's going to hit me. Um, I, I've got to do something. Uh, how often that happens is going to be a function not only of how much stuff is up there, but also how good your knowledge is of where you are and where the debris is that you're, you're trying to avoid. The, the reality is that most conjunctions that happen, the vast majority of them, would never result in a collision even if you did nothing. And uh, so from a long-term perspective, you can say, okay, well, most of those are not going to be a problem. But if you're, you've got your own satellite that you spent years putting together and uh, you're worried that something's going to happen, you're going to be probably a lot more likely to want to do something about it. So there's one of the issues right there. It isn't even that you've got conflict with cost and benefit. You have conflict even with the, within the, the areas that you're trying to, to actually do the protection of. So there's also different levels of significance uh, with, with different aspects of, of the kind of protection that you're trying to do and the kind of rules that you want to implement. Uh, and, and Dan talked about this uh, a little bit, like with the uh, post-mission disposal uh, you know, that you do at the end of your mission. So what do you do with your satellite once you're done with it? Uh, and ideally, you uh, put it into an orbit where it's not going to be a problem. You put it into an orbit where it's going to decay. Even better yet, you get it out of orbit entirely. Uh, what we found with uh, uh, a number of analyses looking at the effects of various different behaviors and what they do on the environment, that post-mission disposal rate is, is really critical to being able to control the environment, especially in, uh, in, in low Earth orbit. So that has a, a the, the ability to do that has a high impact on, on our ability to control uh, what's going on in the long term. Now, um, uh, on the other side of that, you've got things like, um, like collision avoidance. And if you're looking in, for example, if you're looking in the long term, uh, with a lot of the situations that we've that we've looked at, it, it turns out that doing collision avoidance from helping the long term environment is not nearly so important as doing the the uh, post mission disposal, because in theory, with the post mission disposal, you're often going from from staying in orbit for centuries to staying in orbit maybe 25 years or less, and when you're active with a satellite. Normally, your lifetime is five years, eight years, something like that. And beyond that, your collision avoidance doesn't help you. But that's from the long-term perspective. From the short-term perspective, clearly, when you're protecting your satellite, the collision avoidance is important. And another thing, and I'm sure that this got discussed earlier, too, is you know we're standing on the brink of, of just radical changes in space operations. Uh, we're looking at potentially considerably more satellites, considerably more operators. And it's enough of a change that we may be seeing what's important shift around because of the changes in space operations and the way that space gets used. So that whole relative importance thing is another factor that gets thrown in to make this whole process of trying to figure out how to go about um, uh, regulating what the best practices are to to deal with these these space traffic management issues all that much more difficult. There's another compounding factor in here is that there are different kinds of users of space and what affects them and what effect they have on uh, on the problems that we're looking at here with debris are are different. Um, you've got sort of the, the conventional satellite users, potentially, who um, you know, we're familiar with from, from decades of operation. And then, as, as everybody is familiar, you have the small satellite operators that are, that are really um, 
you know, really becoming much more common these days. And the, the capabilities and the approach to operations and the approach to your missions um, from these two different classes of satellites can, can be very, very different, which means your, your satellites have different capabilities, um, their ability to comply with certain rules changes, even the need for them to comply with certain rules can potentially change as, as well, depending on the way they operate. And even within some of these subsets, there are difficulties. Within, within small satellites, you, you have um, operators like some of the, the commercial companies that are building these, these large constellations. You also have small operators, places like universities, organizations that are, that are operating experimental satellites, doing technology demonstrations. They're all potentially small satellites, but how you're using them, the amount of, of things that you're operating uh, and, and to do your mission, um, the capabilities of your satellite, uh, the resources you have access to, your potential effect on the environment are all different. So again, when you're trying to put together these sets of rules, and, and I think we'll discuss some of the manifestations of these, these problems, what's good and makes sense for one group isn't necessarily going to be good or make sense for the other group or even need necessarily the best thing to do. Um, so one of the other things that, that uh, the FCC's rules were, were addressing is trackability issues. Uh, we talked a little bit about how tracking uh, earlier on can affect the, the frequency that you have to do collision avoidance. Um, but Clearly, one of the other, you know, there's there's several other issues associated with this that that I think the FCC was also bringing forward and trying to address. Uh, one of them is is the size issue. You know, we've uh, as technology's gotten better. Obviously, other satellites have shrunk smaller and smaller and smaller in 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 still having something that's actually capable of performing a mission. At some point, those get too small to be easily tracked by the current sensors that we have. Um, how do you address that? Do you not build satellites that small, or do you do you do things to make them more visible, which is another possibility? Uh, another issue with with trackability is that's that's come about because of all the changes that are going on is we have these these multiple deployments, and you've probably seen uh, a lot of those on the news. These launches where you're launching 20 satellites at a time, 50 satellites, 100 satellites at a time. Uh, as you can imagine, you're, you're letting off a bunch of these objects that are all, you know, relatively small. And the sensors that are trying to track these things are looking at them from 1,000 kilometers away, 1,500 kilometers away, and trying to pick them out and figure out which one is which. I mean, if you visualize the distances and the fact that you're talking about objects that are potentially the size that you could hold in your, hold in your hands, uh, you can see why that is is a uh, a an a, spe a special challenge and and another thing that has to be addressed. So overall, you can you can see at least what I'm trying to get across here is that trying to figure out these rules and what makes sense and how to find a balance is is a real challenge and. Um, and it, it's compounded even more by the fact that you've also really got to try to figure out some way to not just develop your rules uh, within a single country like the United States, but also how you get other, um, uh, other countries, uh, other international organizations to go along uh, and do something similar. I mean, it's one of the intrinsic benefits and problems of space is it is it is international by nature. So Marlon, that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, and I think we should move some of that discussion to the discussion section. And I'm sure um, our other panelists have a lot to talk about. Um, for the sake of time, I think, I think we should continue um, and move on to our next panelist, John from Viasat. John, do we still have you on the line? You do. I was just looking for the unmute. Thank you. All right. Can you hear me OK? Yep. All right. Well, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm John Janka. I'm the Chief Officer for Government Affairs and Regulatory uh, for Viasat on a global basis. 
Um, and as some of you may have figured out, we have a very different perspective on this um, than, than the SIA does. Um, our bottom line is, is very simple and very easy to understand. Um, it's that safe space will be at risk if the FCC's totality of the circumstances test is not employed on a going forward basis. And there's a very simple reason for that. And that is, uh, as Marlon explained, there are radical changes occurring in the near term in how space is used. Um, I'll go into this in more detail, but I, I do want to say one thing since there was a lot of uh, discussion about legal standards and all. Um, I think what some people are, are forgetting is that the president in SPD3 said, and I quote, begin with updated ODMSP, but also incorporate sections to address operating practices for large constellations. That's just what the FCC is doing. What's happening right now is we're getting caught up in politics. And we think it's very important that politics be put aside to enable this very important first step towards space safety and the new space era to move forward. So what are, what are the three steps we see? What the FCC is doing in this order, minimizing the creation of orbital debris. That's a very important first step. And at the risk of pointing out the basics, <clears throat> unwanted collisions between spacecraft and other space objects that are 10 centimeters or larger in, in size can release dangerous large debris clouds that can create more collisions. Collisions with smaller objects than 10 centimeters can disable spacecraft and lead to more collisions that no longer can be can be avoided. Um, I agree that tracking debris is important. It's very important, but that doesn't obviate the need to avoid creating additional and unnecessary orbital debris in the first place. Third step is cleaning up the debris that's up there. That's a terrific initiative and a terrific goal. But from our perspective, the first thing we should do is stop the littering of space. There's been a debate <clears throat> about what the correct risk analysis is. And I appreciate that there's a lot of standards out there and a lot of different views. Uh, but one of the approaches that has been recently recommended to the commission um, is that the FCC considers only one element that no, no matter how big your constellation is, you ignore the size of the constellation and the aggregate risk created by the constellation. And instead, you focus on a risk analysis for one single satellite. And you only do that for that one single satellite when it may have a lifetime of two, three, four, five years, even though your FCC license term is for 15 years. That doesn't make a lot of sense to us. But then when you apply that standard, you get to some, I think, potentially tragic consequences. If, if you apply that standard, as, as we have quantified, there would be 100 expected collisions for every 100,000 satellites in orbit, whether they're original satellites or replacement satellites. And you may say, gee, 100,000 satellites seems like a lot, but it's, it's actually uh, a conservative number given the proposals that have been put before the commission. And just do the math, if you have a 15-year license term and a five-year satellite life, the stated constellation size is actually three times the size over the 15 years. The other consequences I'm sure we all would agree should be avoided are 10 expected deaths, human deaths, for every 100,000 satellites. That's what the standard that has been advocated by many in the, in the industry would lead to, those types of expected results. We don't think that's a good starting point. <clears throat> Significantly, the FCC's totality of the circumstances approach 
yields virtually no collisions and virtually no deaths. That's why we applaud the FCC's approach. We are committed. Viasat is a technology company. We have lots of experience building, designing, launching, and operate satellites and ground networks of all types, GEO and LEO. We know that we and everyone else can build and design satellite systems right here in the United States of America that enable innovative and affordable broadband service and also ensure safe space. Another thing that's very important to us is collision avoidance capabilities. We think that collision avoidance capabilities above a certain altitude and spacecraft maneuverability reliability are essential elements of ensuring safe space. So that means, and I'll get to the altitude in a moment, but that means that above a certain altitude, spacecraft need to have maneuverability so they can get out of the way and avoid collisions. They need to have sufficient propellant. They need to have robust communication capabilities so they can be commanded. They need to be suitably resilient to damage from small objects. They need to be reliable so that you know that over their life, their orbital lifetime, that they are able to avoid collisions. Now let's talk for a moment about the CubeSats because there's a lot of discussion about CubeSats. Putting non-maneuverable CubeSats into densely populated orbits that are po densely populated by LEOs is like putting go-karts on a freeway. Nobody would do that. CubeSats are important, LEOs are important. Each of them needs their own space. Why is that the case? Because the future launches of CubeSats, which we know are coming, whether it's from universities or, or amateurs or, 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 or experimental um, houses, those future launches are not included in the DAS analysis that gets run by LEO systems. So the risk of collisions between the CubeSats and the LEOs wouldn't be calculated. And if you have the LEOs that fail when they're in orbit, their systems become unreliable, things just break, um, they get hit by small debris, that satellite then becomes an uncontrollable source of orbital debris and it creates additional collision risks with the CubeSats. Okay, so what do you do with the CubeSats? Well, from our perspective, CubeSats could potentially operate up to around 600 kilometers. In our perspective, 600 kilometers is the break point where there's a reasonable period of time where, where they could deorbit if there's an issue. However, if that were to occur, you'd have to deal with the LEOs that have been proposed in the five to 600 kilometer range. Um, and, and since the small SAT report and order that the FCC issued a little bit ago, uh, I'm calculating that there are four to 6,000 uh, LEO satellites that have been proposed in orbits between five to 600 kilometers. They're contending for orbits among each other. So, so putting the CubeSats in the same area creates another issue. Um, that's something that, that should be considered. If folks want to consider raising the, the minimum orbit for CubeSats, then you have to consider the consequences uh, for the LEOs. Another thing I'd like to point out is that from our perspective, the FCC's draft order memorializes many principles that the FCC has already been using to ensure safe space. And they've been using these in processing LEO applications for the past approximately four years. In fact, many applicants have already been asked 
about total system collision probability in the licensing process. And notably, their licenses remain subject to the outcome of this rulemaking, which actually creates an interesting situation. For all of the opposition to this order, on allegedly that it's going to create case-by-case -case analysis and that's bad, that's actually what's going to happen right now. The FCC has two choices. They can either analyze the applications that are before them and move them forward while this rulemaking is pending, in which case it's a case-by-case -case analysis. And I'm pretty sure that they're gonna to continue to apply the same rigor they've applied over the course of the past few years. The other alternative, which is not necessarily the right one, is to stop licensing. So I'm very concerned um, that nobody has brought solutions to the FCC, that there has been an 18 month period when this has been pending, there's 1200 pages of advocacy, and it still appears that the industry is engaging in a little bit of perhaps navel gazing, perhaps something else. So John, so a great note to end on. Yeah, may I finish, please? May I finish? Other people had 15 minutes. Okay, Therese? And I want to cover two other things. If you can quickly I, I will. It was seven I will. minutes. I will. But every time you interrupt me, it takes longer. The tragedy of the commons is why the FCC cannot rely on industry standards. Industry standards have no teeth. And there is a natural incentive on the part of some in the industry to expect that others will clean up their mess. This has been talked about in academia and we're facing it. The last thing is a question, a rhetorical question. Why do those who profess an interest in safe space oppose regulation that would lead to that very result and why do they advocate for an approach that would lead to a large number of unexpected catastrophic events? That's my question for you. Okay, thanks, John. That was a great way to wrap it up. Um, Charity, uh, you are up next with AstroScale. Thank you, Trees. Uh, thank you to all the, the panelists that are here today and for everyone that is online. Uh, this is a new concept for me and I can't promise my cats will jump up on my lap uh, in mid mid discussion, but let's, uh, let's get into it. And I just only have a few minutes of remarks and we can save some time for Q&A. Uh, I wanna know who remembers the widely covered conjunction event over Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania last January. Uh, close conjunctions are in fact a regular occurrence and they're bound to become more so. They happen all the time. Take for example last night, according to Leo Labs, two large and long defunct satellites conjuncted at 1400 kilometers. Thankfully it was a low probability occurrence at a 70 meter miss distance. The rules we follow today were made in a different era and they need to be updated. I get that un changing the way we do things is hard and uncomfortable, but doing so is both necessary and urgent. It is in the interest of all space operators to minimize the creation of new orbital debris. Those are not my words. Those are in the Space Policy Directive 3. And within, it says the U.S. needs to develop policies and regulations for future U.S. orbital operations. AstroScale's part in this started early in January 2019 when we reached out to other forward-thinking spaceflight safety-oriented companies who are cognizant of the importance and urgency of the debate. Together, we submitted a detailed comment into this rule and for lack of better term, nicknamed the group GNO for Global New Space Operators. I wanna thank LTS Space Machines, NanoRacks, OrbitFab, ROCOR, SpaceBridge Logistics, Space Exploration Engineering, and SpaceNav for contributing and supporting this effort. The critical pieces we wanted to convey were that satellite operators, whether new or established, large or small, experimental or fully operational, 
have a duty of care obligation. That any updated rule that should drive behavior should drive behavior and not dictate technology to be used. That core to responsible space operations is transparency of operations and orbital data, ensuring your satellite is trackable and identifiable, and making sure you not just have a deorbit plan that considers a healthy satellite, but one that plans for deorbit with a satellite that is no longer functional. If I had to boil it down, like Dan's kindergarten analogy, it would be be a good orbital neighbor, don't run into things, don't let things run into you, and get your stuff out of the way when you're done with it. Not in 25 years, ASAP. I do also agree with Dan that the details on how to measure metrics is critical to the conversation. Overall, this rule needed to take a meaningful step forward to protect the public interest. And that public interest is highlighted today by virtue of our reliance for security, commerce, and yes, connectivity to continue operating and communicating during a global pandemic. We, industry and government space stakeholders, have to get this right. This RNO has asked relevant questions, encouraged industry dialogue, and it's just the start to an enhanced and modernized protocol for the mitigation of debris. Whereas industry or international practices are aspirational and voluntary, a ceiling, as it were, domestic regulation is the floor, the absolute minimum required. We need to raise the debris mitigation floor. With regard to active debris removal, direct retrieval is becoming an option to satisfy regulatory requirements and also to safeguard and assure continuity of operations. Given the increasing use and congestion of space and debris fields within, there's also a business imperative to consider here. On a policy level, SPD3 mentions active debris removal. The new ODMSP recognized ADR as a disposal method. And now here, the FCC is talking to debris, sorry, to direct retrieval. Should the technology be mature and on a case-by-case -case basis. This is moving in the right direction. Internationally, uh, the Commissioner Rosenworcher mentioned both Japan and ESA are moving forward with ADR programs. This will be a part of a new in-orbit ecosystem, an activity that will help mitigate and remediate the environment. The FCC here is safeguarding the public interest and ensuring space con commerce continues unabated. What the order doesn't answer is, how many dead satellites, especially in the 400 to 650 zone, is an operator allowed to have in orbit at any one time? This is why metrics and compliance is so critical here. We are concerned that a 400 to 600 kilometer range will be a victim of unintended consequences of pushing everything down to the magic 25 year line by the way, happy anniversary to the 25 year old. It's 25 years old this year. With that, I look forward to discussing the RNO, particularly the need for compliance and enforcement, the unintended consequence, the 25 year rule, and the need to avoid the creation of further debris by rethinking post mission disposal practices. Back to you, Teresa. Thanks so much, Charity. Um, so I'd like to get kicked off with a few questions and I'll also bring in the audience questions as we go. Um, a reminder, you can feel free to post your questions in the chat and they will get forwarded to me and hopefully can cover those in the discussion. Um, so I guess one of the big issues that John touched on quite a bit is whether you measure collision probability in aggregate or from an individual satellite. Um, and it looks like it will be covered in the FNPRM. Um, with, you know, constellations of many thousands of satellites, there's certainly an increased uh, collision risk. Um, although a lot of NGSO operators would certainly argue that they're doing their best right now to work with government agencies to simulate their, constel sim simulate their constellations um, and voluntarily avoid uh, collisions as best as possible when they're designing their constellations. Um, what steps forward do you think that 
can be taken, you know, either from a regulatory perspective um, or voluntarily to encourage industry to be better actors? And is there some intermediary between, you know, the individual versus aggregate constellation one in a thousand collision probability chance? I'll let any of the panelists answer that, by the way. Is that an open question, Therese? It's an open question, yes. Yeah, I guess I would say you should start with the facts, right? You should start by understanding the aggregate risk presented by a constellation, right? That, that can be determined, you know, mathematically by certain models. And the starting point is what is the risk? and the risk is bigger, the larger the constellation that is, right? It's like, it's like cars on a freeway, right? If, if, the, if, if um, you know, forgive the reference to the beltway for those folks who don't live in Washington, but if you had an empty beltway and somebody wanted to get on the beltway with a car that didn't have very good brakes, you would probably say, you know, that's your own business. Um, small chance of you running into anybody um, and it's your own risk. But if you put 100,000 cars on the beltway and everybody has bad brakes, you probably would say, hmm, that doesn't sound very good. Maybe we should take a look. So if you assess the overall risk and use that as a starting point, then I think the appropriate question is, is that risk acceptable? And if the risk is not acceptable, what is that constellation going to do to minimize the risk? That's how we think it should be analyzed. And there's a variety of trade-offs that can be made. <clears throat> you know, it, it can be a function of the size of the satellite, the number of the satellites, the nature of the propulsion system, the amount of the propellant that they contain, whether they're robust to being hit by small constellations. But if you don't start by, by giving uh, an honest answer to what the risk is, it's very difficult to do a meaningful assessment of what to do about it. So I'd also love to hear from Dan and Marlon um, on this risk assessment and whether you think you know operators can even evaluate um, this one in a thousand risk in aggregate and in, in a way that is acceptable to the FCC and clear um, for those, for others when they're filing their applications um, and other measures that you think could be taken to mitigate risk for large constellations. Yeah, I'll start. Uh, um, there are established methods for, uh, for computing That's not risk. Really the, the unknown or uh, in question here, um, to me, the bigger question is what data is available and for SSA centers to feed them. There's been, I think, a lot of progress in the commercial industry that can be leveraged on safety of flight uh, tools and, and, and uh, uh, better data. That, that would include things like the Space Data Association, which operators can partake in to share their data the best available data on that operator satellite typically and also the new commercial uh, uh, SSA centers and uh, also the uh, on-orbit servicing that's going on exciting things with the MEV-1 and active debris removal and then sensor observations from uh, data providers available so those those exist we we have research I'm happy on to share with anyone actual risk is um, and that that's based on a, a January paper we presented in, in, in DC. So, so the, the risk is real. Some people think the, the sky is big, uh, but but in fact, uh, this uh, risk is a, a is satellites. Real. And if you look at the because driver for that, one of the big is data quality. And if you consider what the collision probability in the way that it's assessed in industry if you don't know what's up in space or if you know what's up there but you your uh your errors are in you would compute a zero collision probability and not think because you don't know 
know any better. We are in an area where we know some things, we have some good data, but with some of these new SSA centers and algorithms and data fusion and crowdsourcing of data, we can get to the other side of this curve where you're able to dismiss a lot of the potential collision risk because you can show that it will not happen. It's too far away. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Marlon, but uh, we're happy to discuss. Uh, Thanks, Dan. We had one request to turn on your mic if you're answering questions. <laughs> or your, not your mic, your video. Um, Marlon, are you still on the line? Would you like to add I anything? Am. I, I am still on the line. That's my big accomplishment. So, uh, you know, um, John brings up a, a good point that's actually pretty significant is the question of, of what's acceptable. Uh, the reality is there are a lot of different possible ways that the debris environment could involve, evolve, uh, that the risks could evolve, and, and it's a continuum. And one of the very difficult things, and it's, it's, it's a problem when you're trying to deal with developing guidelines, developing policy, developing rules, developing standards is what's acceptable and what's not. Um, I mean, we, we can certainly go through and we do it all the time. Um, and, and of course, our colleagues at NASA and others around the world going through and looking and saying, OK, what do we think the, the overall average risks are? Where do we think the environment's going to evolve given different kinds of behavior? Uh, the problem is, where do you draw the line and say, well, on this side of the line, it's OK, and on this side of the line, it's not, uh, particularly because it's 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 not the same for for everybody. Uh, and another thing that, that goes back to, to what I was one of the things I was discussing earlier is there's different aspects of the risk that you're worried about, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, you know, Dan was talking about uh, issues of like pr protecting your satellite. What are, what are the chances that your satellite's going to get hit? Um, there's also the long-term risk, which is really more what something like the 25-year rule or the, the 0 .0001 um, probability of collision is aimed at, is, is preventing the growth of, um, of the environment in the long term uh, to keep it manageable. And as I said, the, the issues involved in protecting your satellite immediately versus protecting the environment are not always the same thing. And, and as we go through this discussion, that's one of the things to keep in mind is what problem is it that we're thinking about when we're talking about these things? I just, so over to you, Tree. Oh, yep, I was gonna let you go. Yeah. Now this is not, not a technical kind of comment, but more of a process comment. Um, the FCC put this in their NPRM. What do you think of aggregate versus individual satellite? And the comments came in and debated that. And so I'm not quite sure what what more is going to be asked in the FNPRM that hasn't already been looked at in the first round about it, about this. I'll just put that out there. They did ask this. And Charity, we had a question from the audience um, asking about whether the maturation of active debris removal business cases um, might overcome some of the resistance in uh, changing this rule, the collision probability rule. Well, as I noticed, uh, I noted the FCC in the in the rule. It does say they will consider direct retrieval uh, should the technology ad application be mature and on a case by case basis. So this is a good door opener for innovative companies to do this business modeling of what is the cost of leaving your stuff up there versus having uh, a service come take it out of orbit. Okay, and then another thing that came up, um, which I think was a surprise that's getting moved to the FNPRM is revisiting the 25 year rule. Um, at least within SIA, I think a lot of members recognize the 25, that 25 years is too long. We haven't been able to come up with a proposal um, to decrease the 25 year rule. Does anyone have ideas on what this could look like? Especially, you know, Dan, when reviewing other countries' guidelines, have you found anything um, or have any ideas on how decreasing the 25 year rule might be implemented? Yeah, I'll speak to that. Um, first off, I, I do want to foot stomp what, what Marlon said is that 
if you look at collision probability thresholds, um, the threshold that an operator would choose to protect their mission and their, their financial stream uh, and their customers, that is kind of fundamentally a different threshold than one might pick for long-term sustainability. That's just a fact. Now, if we turn over to the orbital debris uh, lifetime rule, and, and kind of, I think it's important to, to step back to where that came from. Back in the early days, there was uh, there were studies done. I'm I'm told secondhand that looked at different uh, knees in the curve, uh, 25 year, 50 year lifetimes. Um, the conclusion, even back then, without knowing all the traffic of today, is that orbit lifetime is a, a central a tenant, a, a knob we can adjust to try and keep things uh, sustainable. Back at that time, there was discussion of should it be 50 years or 25, and they went with 25. So people that that worry about their mission because their predicted lifetime is 25.01 years and say, well, that's not acceptable, letter of the law, I suppose, but you have to look at the context of this. This is a tool to help us be sustainable. At the same time, like I said, I'm, I'm program manager for Space Data Center, and we have 30 operators, and we do conjunction assessments all the time. And while, um, while for long-term sustainability's sake, it may be that the difference between 25 and 5, for example, is not all that significant, I can tell you, and, and our encounter rate paper from January shows, there are millions of conjunctions that are being identified. And now that we have large constellations in the area uh, below the 25 year limit, which is roughly 650, 600 kilometers, um, having, uh, having the threshold be 25 means that a lot of the satellites which might naturally decay will end up conjuncting repeatedly with large constellations that are going into that very area. So to me, it's not just about even long-term sustainability. It's about making sure that we have the bandwidth to identify those serious conjunctions. And, uh, Thanks, Dan, and I saw Chair one of the phrases I like to use is, got it, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Charity had her hand up, so go ahead, Charity. I, I want to hear that phrase. Dan, what phrase do you use? Uh, the phrase is simply, if you want to find a needle in a haystack, you need to get rid of the hay. And right now, our SSA processes are cranking out low-quality data that results in thousands, if not millions, of conjunctions. That's it. Right. Um, I just wanted to point out that industry is ahead of the game here a little bit. The Space Safety Coalition, uh, their best practice best practice document does identify five years as a ceiling, like as a an aspirational goal here. And in practice, many of the satellite operators today aim for ten or less years. So this isn't something that should be all you know, surprising to regulators that the industry is moving down a path of uh, lower and lower um, years remaining in orbit, which is all well and good. As I pointed out, the 400 to 650 kilometer range uh, regulation, the unintended consequence of a 25 year rule is everything's getting jammed in that uh, highway, if you will. And, and that's of a big concern. And like Dan says, it's about the congestion all the collision uh, warnings and the conjunctions that would be happening, that is the real effect on the industry. Look Sorry for the cat. <laughs> um, I'm gonna shift directions a little bit because we had an overwhelming number of people ask about indemnification. Um, so s some people asked, you know, people were surprised by the indemnification provision. It, is, it, e is there even case law for the SEC to do this? Um, so I'd also ask, is is there precedent from any other country to include indemnification um, in their licensing process? And where did the SEC get this idea from? Uh, if anyone could comment on that, that'd be great. 
I'll take a crack at it. Uh, I am aware that the United Kingdom has an indemnification clause for in-orbit activity. Also here in the US, the FAA does this as well for launch. So there is precedent of such a thing, but there are upper limits. So that is probably something that needs to be looked at in the FMPRM. The other thing is, you know, it's about carrots and sticks. So if you're putting an actual value on a clean orbit or an, a, an unsustainable orbit, that actually helps satellite operators understand the real costs involved here. So that might be something that also is brought up uh, in the comment period coming up. And then I know there were a lot of questions um, regarding the proposed bond requirement, which is also in the FNPRM and how that would be enforced. Um, does anyone know of you know, other countries that have done something similar? Um, how do we think it could be enforced? I know a lot of satellite failures, um, we, we don't even know the cause of a lot of satellite failures. So I think that's one of the main concerns right now and how this might be implemented. I'll jump on again. I don't want to, you know, I'll be very quick. Um, maybe not in the space industry, but in the nuclear decommissioning industry, oil and gas, uh, offshore industry, they're, they're all analogies to bond decommissioning, et cetera. So there might be some good lessons learned there. I mean, um, it's John. I guess I have a, another rhetorical question. Um, what should the consequences be if somebody doesn't do what they promise they're going to do? Should you be able to make commitments to the federal government in your application? Commitments that form the basis for an authorization that you get and then not follow through on those commitments? Presumably the answer is no. So if that isn't the answer, then what should be done? I, I, I go back to my question earlier. There's a lot of criticisms. It's been 18 months and 1,200 pages of record. Uh, nobody's come up with any solutions. So I would just ask people that question. If you don't care for the bond, then, then what should occur? I know Aerospace put out a paper today that uh, one of their proposed solutions was a sort of carbon credit system where you know companies could get so many credits um, and then have to buy new credits um, if they didn't successfully dispose their satellites. So that was one innovative solution that I thought was interesting. Um, I'm sure we'll get some interesting comments in the FNP around as well. One thing that yeah, I, I uh, oh sorry, go ahead, Marlon. Sorry. Yeah, I, I don't have an easy way to raise my hand. So, um, yeah, I I would like to comment and say that 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 paper is uh, uh, certainly worth a a a read. Uh, they look at a, a lot of different considerations from from the practical side as to what are what are options to to getting us where we need to be uh, in terms of in this case disposal. How could you how could you sort of rate the advantages and disadvantages of them? How can you scale that with, with different aspects that are important in, in terms of, of actually making them in, implementable, actually having teeth? So it's, it's a, a, a very uh, thought-provoking kind of paper that, that to, to get at one of these actually very difficult questions is how do you actually make this stuff work? How do you implement it? And I was just going to quickly add that uh, the PMD, for example, in the application process, it's, how do you measure that? I, I'm sure there's some secret sauce that goes into what is my predicted reliability of my satellite uh, of, of it going to function in orbit, but that's before you go. How about actuality? How about measuring this, you know, through the life, lifetime of the, the constellation, if you will? Um, and I did read in the the, the circuit, uh, the draft rule anyway, that if you go above these thresholds of 90% or uh, one in a thousand uh, PC, that is a self-report kind of thing. And the, the FCC would uh, maybe look at modifying your license because of that. And we just got a question that 
Um, I think it's relatively straightforward to answer. Has there ever been a case of operators being held responsible for any irres irresponsible actions in space? And how might that play out um, in terms of this uh, order or FNPRM? Define irresponsible. <laughs> they cited um, the space bees as one example, but I, I think they're thinking about, you know, if you don't take all of the collision avoidance uh, maneuver, if you don't do a collision avoidance maneuver, um, you know, if you don't properly do it, things like that. I, I, this is Dan, I would say um, that there are some cases where if people should be doing collision avoidance and they're, they're Ignoring all, all or the warnings, in. that's in my, my mind irresponsible. But I want to make it very clear that even if the the government uh, has an edict for what the collision probability should be, and the operator rigorously adheres to that using whatever algorithm and whatever data is available, we still have a chance of collision. So you know it still could happen. Um, the chance the, the goal here my, is that as much as as possible, but um, that chance is always there, and and I think Charity's right. Right, define what is irresponsible is he's a bad. Thanks, Dan. Um, and we have a bunch of questions related to active debris removal. Um, people asking, you know, is there some kind of international government association that could be, um, you know using active debris removal spacecraft to capture um, debris? Is it only going to be the job of private companies? Um, if companies you know, fail at correctly assessing their uh, plans and expected results, um, you know, could, could this incentivize them to buy services from an active debris removal company? Um, Charity, if you have any comments on that for the audience. So there is no international um, organization that is pooling all the resources and um, sending up debris removal services uh, right now. So that's that's not happening quite yet. Uh, there are numerous companies that are looking at this technology and looking at the business plans and the policy uh, of which one is Astroscale and there are many others that uh, could potentially provide a really good service for commercial operators and like I said before, to help them adhere to any regulations that are coming. Thanks. Um, so out of all of these regulations, I mean, a lot of them are based on existing standards. Um, we've talked about some of the gaps that exist in the order and in the FNPRM. Um, are there any other major areas that you think need to be addressed either by the FCC or by another regulatory body in the US government to sort of get on the right track for orbital debris mitigation that we haven't talked about already? Dan, here, I, I would, again, underscore the need for uh, standardizing and requiring uh, certain uh, algorithms. I think the FCC document does quite well in, in consistently pointing to the NASA DAS software to do some of these assessments. But uh, again, on collision probability, um, that, is, that is not so standard. And also getting, addressing the, the problem of, of SSA data and having it be a, a, of quality so that it can support decisions. And I just say, um, having a more urgency when it comes to developing a space traffic management scheme is it should be maybe not discussed at FCC. Obviously, Department of Commerce has a stake in this, and uh, given it SBD three, so all these things need to happen in parallel, and they need to be harmonized, and they need to happen now. Yeah, and Therese, I would, I would, I would agree with Charity's point about now. There's a really interesting OECD paper that came out about a week ago. Um, and it says that with the expected dramatic increase of, of operational LEOs in the next few years, and I quote, it is not a question of if a defunct satellite will collide with debris, but when. And OECD says 
that, yeah, we do need um, some international standards, and that's important, but they also say that short-term policy solutions require implementation at the national level, um, and they also say that compliance with existing standards is insufficient to stabilize the orbital environment. So I would say start right away with some national decisions, start to implement them, and then over the coming years, work to build some international consensus with the U.S. being the leader as it normally is. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, no, go ahead. Okay, I was just going to finish up. I mean, I have to, I have to agree that um, that now working on things sooner rather than later is critical. In in um, all, all the assessments that we've done, um, that you can clearly see that um, the longer you wait to try to to accomplish things, the more difficult things get, the then the worse they get. Um, but I would also um, in, in, like to uh, point out that I think it's critical to choose the directions that you go based on um, based on actual uh, analysis, based on on uh, assessing what really is going to be a value and what really is not. Uh, just because something feels like it's going to be good and helpful doesn't mean it actually is. And you could spend in space a whole lot of money not accomplishing anything uh, when you could be using those resources to do things that are more worthwhile. So I, I think that's that that I think is critical if we want to actually succeed. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Marlon. Um, there are certainly, you know, lots of steps that can be taken to mitigate debris, but some are certainly very costly. And as some companies have pointed out, um, there are, you know, potential regulations that would make their entire business cases unviable. Um, so definitely have to figure out a balance of that. And we're almost out of time, so I wanted to ask all of the panelists if they had any final remarks on, you know, where we might be going or anything else that should be considered as, um, you know, we go and go through the FNPRM. Um, so, Dan, if you want to start. Yeah, uh, I, I do want to underscore the, the point that was just made by John. We do need to get going on space traffic management. We've been talking about it for years. Um, and, and what we have today is, you know, kudos to it being there and being freely available. Uh, you know, it's pretty good data generally, but it has deficiencies that must be overcome. And uh, so I think we need to get going. We need to recognize that in terms of the FCC proposed rules, there, there is, as, as Marlon was pointing out, there's the long-term sustainability flavor that the regulations are meant to address. They're really how our country is going to interpret the treaties and guidelines that we've signed up to and, and come up with those such that operators are able to, um, you know, meet those, but also with the eye towards long-term sustainability. So uh, in my mind, again, I'll put a plug in for having much better SSA data than, than we currently do and trying to reduce the false alarms so that operators can focus on what's truly important and get good enough data that we could compute collision probability and casualty risk and these other things that are in the SEC rules so that we get a good result. Thanks, Dan. I agree. Data is a huge problem, and hopefully we can work to improve our data sources. Um, Marlon, did you have any final remarks? Uh, yeah, just just I think that that what's come out of things like this, this FCC effort is is the discussion about it that I think is absolutely critical. Um, it, this helps uh, get people interested in what's going on, uh, have the, the uh, decision makers see what the, what the questions are and, and really get a chance to put on the table what is it that we really need to be doing and where we need to be going because we, we need to do that. And, and I do want to say that, that certainly this is, is going on on the international level. I mean, I've been working on that for, for 20 years now. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of the international community that understands this is critical because um, clearly, as I said earlier, this is space doesn't have any national boundaries. One bad actor can mess it up for everybody. So it, it's absolutely necessary that we all work together on this as soon as we can. Yeah, 
and continue to. Okay, thank you, Marlon. John? Um, I just say that um, I hope that uh, Chairman Pai and the rest of the FCC commissioners uh, continue to exhibit the foresight and leadership um, that they exhibited by proposing the draft order. I, I hope that they close this proceeding out quickly so that the certainty that's necessary uh, for the industry develops and we can all get on with our businesses. And Therese, I just wanted to thank you for allowing a rather spirited discussion. <laughs> Thanks, John. Certainly appreciate your contributions. Uh, Charity, did you have any final remarks? Yeah, um, I do. I, I reckon back to something that Chris Johnson from Secure Real said, if you don't have a regulatory compliance plan as part of your business plan, you don't have a business plan. And I want to I want to ramp that up a bit and say, if you don't have a regulatory compliance and an airtight disposal plan, you don't have a business plan. So three things that operators, I want to, their takeaways for you, prepare for the unexpected, design your spacecraft for capture should an in-orbit anomaly occur, expedite dis disposal, plan for a direct re-entry into the atmosphere as soon as the mission is complete. If this isn't possible, have a backup plan to have it under control to enter 400 kilometers leave no trace. And then the third thing, join like-minded responsible operators in developing further best practices. There are several organizations out there like SIA, like SSE, like CONFERS that are moving the needle absent regulation. And I want to thank you, Teresa, as well for uh, moderating and having a great discussion today. Okay, well, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists, Dan, Marlin, uh, John, and Charity. And um, there are a few questions in the chat if anyone wants to stick around to answer them. But this concludes our uh, presentation portion of the session. And I look forward to seeing the final order and the FNPRM. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Okay, thank you.